And now I'm happy to introduce Professor Dan Garber of Princeton University, who will give us a lecture on metaphysics and theology, the role of monadology in theodicy. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Marilyn. It's a, it's um, particularly difficult, I think, to come um, at the end of such a wonderful conference. Um, in a certain sense, um, um, everything important, or almost everything important. I hope, has, has already been said. Um, and um, people are just a little bit tired um, by this time, and I'll try not to um, try your patience. But um, the other talks in um, this conference have been dealing um, mainly with what are central issues um, in the theodicy and in Leibniz's um, um, theological writings. Um, in my talk, um, I'm going to talk about, in a certain way, uh, the converse, the central issues that are not in the theodicy, and um, in fact, what are um, marginal issues um, in the theodicy. And the, the question is really why it is that um, um, a number of the metaphysical issues that um, we are um, usually occupied with in, in studying Leibniz um, seem to be playing such a, um, a small role um, in the um, theodicy. Um, but I'm hoping that this will lead us to um, some larger reflections about um, Leibniz's intellectual project, actually Leibniz's intellectual projects um, in the plural, and how it is that um, uh, the Theodicy Project um, um, fits into uh, the larger constellation of um, Leibniz's intellectual uh, interests. Um, writing on 5 May 1714, Nicholas Ramon marked that a friend, quote, spoke rightly when he compared the knowledge we have of your system of monads to that which one would have of the sun by the single rays that escape the clouds that cover it. Um, at that point, the essay de, de Teodosi, uh, published four years earlier, was one of the main sources um, that Leibniz's public had for learning the details of um, his metaphysics. Given the centrality of, the, of Leibniz's monadology project in our current view of uh, that philosopher, it's somewhat odd um, that contemporaries outside of a very small circle of his correspondence, um, had such little knowledge of the world of Leibnizian monads. Uh, this is particularly odd given the recent publication of the Essay de Theodosy. Um, if the monadology was indeed as central um, to Leibniz's thought as it seems to be, why um, is there not more evidence of it in Leibniz's most visible foray into the public sphere? Um, and that's the question that I'd like to explore in my talk today. What was the relationship between Leibniz's metaphysical project as set out in the so-called monodologie and the more um, theological project in the Essai de Théodicie? More generally, I hope that the investigation will clarify the place of both the Essai de Théodicie and the monodology project in Leibniz's larger thought. Let me say at the beginning that um, um, I do draw a distinction between the particular texts, the Essay de, de, de Théodicy and the Monodologie, and the intellectual project, the Theodicy project, and the Monodology project. And I hope that that will become a little bit clear as, um, as the uh, talk goes on. Um, so what is the Monodology project? Um, let me clarify just, just what it is that I mean by that. Uh, Leibniz's metaphysics is, is wide-ranging and involves quite a number of doctrines, including pre-established harmony, the view that the ultimate realities are genuine unities, the claim that there's no real communication among substances, the claim that every substance mirrors the entire world in which it exists, among many other claims. But in a narrower and more precise sense, I take the monodology to be the metaphysical claim that the ultimate constituents of the world are non-extended simple substances, um, all of whose qualities are understood in terms of perception and appetition. 
Um, a direct consequence of this is the further, further claim that bodies must somehow be understood in terms of monads. And I want to understand the monadology in, the, uh, um, in this way to differentiate it from the corporeal substance metaphysics that um, I think, and perhaps some others as well, think that Leibniz held in um, earlier years. And on that metaphysics, as I understand it, the ultimate constituents of the world are corporeal substances understood on analogy with living organisms, souls and bodies joined together. Now, many of the doctrines characteristic of Leibniz's metaphysics were formulated originally with the corporeal substance metaphysics um, in mind. Insofar as corporeal substances were taken to be unities, one can say that on the corporeal substance um, uh, metaphysics, unities are at the foundation of the world. Leibniz also thought that the doctrine of pre-established harmony, originally the hypothesis of concomitance, held for corporeal substances um, as well. But the doctrine of monads proper, understood as non-extended simple substances, goes a step beyond. The view seems to emerge sometime in the mid-1690s, though it's not entirely clear when Leibniz became really committed to the view. But starting in 1694, 1695, the term simple substance begins to creep into the vocabulary, followed closely by the term monad, which seems to appear for the first time in a letter of um, July 1695. And by the late 1690s, it's pretty clear that Leibniz has signed on um, to this new metaphysics of monads. Now, um, the doctrine of monads is discussed and developed in letters to Wagner, to Sophie, to de Volder, among um, a number of others. But while there's ample evidence of Leibniz's commitment to a monadological metaphysics um, in these notes and letters, uh, monads are much less in evidence in the published writings, um, as Ramon complained. In the Système Nouveau, uh, 1695, Leibniz talks about, quote, real unities absolutely destitute of parts, the first absolute principles of the composition of things, and as it were, the final elements in the analysis of substances. Um, this is, of course, very suggestive of the later monological metaphysics, though I've argued it isn't uh, completely unambiguous. Um, but in any case, it's pretty much all the reader has to go on in this text. Um, in the Système Nouveau, Leibniz mentions neither simple substances nor monads and says no more about his deeper metaphysics uh, than this brief um, uh, sentence that I've quoted. Uh, the term monad actually appears first in print uh, in the De Absinatura of 1698, uh, but it's hard to get anything like the full doctrine of the monadology from the short, short passages in the De Absinatura. Um, um, and I'll skip over that a little bit. Um, and monads are not much more visible in the few philosophical publications that follow the De Absinatura and precede the Essay de Theodosie. Um, even the most attentive reader of Leibniz's published writings could hardly guess um, the full depth of his metaphysics, or for that matter, uh, the very thesis that the ultimate constituents of the world um, are monads. This is just on the basis of the published writings before the um, um, <coughs> Essay de Theodosie. Now, what about this first pu this publication in, 16, in 1710? Uh, what role does the monadology play in the Essay de Theodosie? Well, the answer is not very much. Um, Leibniz was clearly thinking about his monological metaphysics at the time that he was writing the Essay de Theodosie. The monadology played a significant role in the correspondence with de Volder that had ended in 1706 and was playing a significant role in the correspondence with de Bose that was going on at the moment when Leibniz <laughs> was composing the Essay de Theodosie. And in fact, Leibniz, de, de Bose turns out to be a um, translator of the Essay de Theodicé. Uh, and the, that discussion would continue until Leibniz's death. But you wouldn't know it from reading the Essay de Theodicé that were published um, in 1710. The term monad 
appears exactly once in that 